Thank you all for being here today. We're going to go ahead and get started. I know folks have a lot of stuff going on this evening, so we'll start promptly so that you can make it home. For my students, I hear there's this TV show called House of Cards that's out now that many of you are going to be watching. Well, again, welcome. My name's Jason Husser. I'm a political science professor here at Elon and your moderator for this evening. This is the fourth Community Connections of 2015-2016. Our theme tonight is education, race, and ethnicity in Alamance County and beyond. The Community Connection series is sponsored by the Burlington Times News and Elon University. Our goal with these forums is to create thoughtful dialogue with members of the university community as well as those who live in Alamance County and the surrounding area. Previous forums have explored issues surrounding health care, gun violence, education, poverty, food insecurity, welfare, and the future of Alamance County. This is the third and final installment in a three-part series on race relations in the United States and in Alamance County. And we're very delighted to see so many of you here tonight for what is a very important topic and will continue to be. Here's the basic ground rules of tonight's forum. If this is your first time at Community Connections, welcome. We hope tonight's evening is really a conversation. Um, we think it's a great opportunity to have a lively format of a conversation between you, our audience, and our panelists, who are very informed and more of our conversation leaders and authoritative experts that are telling you the answers. We really want this to be a conversation. Please bring your questions. We have microphones on um, both aisles here for your use. One thing about the microphone, some people can project well, but you can't project backwards, and you can't project directly into the camera. So if you will, please use the microphones to ask your questions. For those of you following tonight on Twitter, we're using the hashtag TNElonConnect, the same hashtag we've used in the past. We are being filmed, and I'll share that YouTube video as broadly as I can, so be aware that we are being filmed. And here's just one thing. Um, these issues are tough emotionally. Uh, race is something that a lot of times people just shut down about and don't discuss whatsoever. Um, but we do hope that we can have that conversation tonight. We hope that our conversation is productive, that it's civil, that this is not a debate or a political rally, but it's an opportunity for folks to communicate freely and express themselves. And we hope that you feel comfortable engaging thoughtfully and honestly. We only have about an hour. Education and race are topics that are huge. There is no way we're covering everything that needs to be said. Um, we will certainly leave out some very important parts of this conversation. But we do hope that in that hour we can, in many ways, provide a starting point for broader conversations. So without further ado, I'll introduce our panelists. First, we have Patsy Simpson, who is a board member of Alamance Burlington School Systems. Thank you very much for being here. We also have Carrie Thiel, who is Executive Direct Director of Alamance Partnership for Children. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Carlos Valera here is a teacher in Alamance Burlington School System. We also have my friend Randy Williams, who's Presidential Fellow, Special Assistant to the President, and Dean of Multicultural Affairs here at Elon University. Whenever I introduce Randy, I have to write down his title because he's so busy with so many roles. Thanks to each of you for help leading our conversation today. Each of our panelists have broad experiences in many different walks of life related to education. I'd like to start out by reading two quotes. For two figures who delivered these quotes work together um, around the same time. Here's the first quote. Until justice is blind to color, until education is unaware of race, until opportunity is unconcerned with the color of men's skin, emancipation will be a proclamation, but not a fact. That was by Lyndon Johnson in 1963. Here's another quote. I have the audacity to believe that peoples everywhere can have three meals a day for their bodies, education and culture for their minds, and dignity and quality and freedom for their spirits. It was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Nobel Peace Prize accepted speech in Oslo, Norway in 1964. Education was clearly important to both Johnson and King and hundreds of other important figures throughout history. Uh, many thinkers have viewed education as a fundamental tool for social change. So I'll start out with just a conversation opening question to each of our panelists. And is education today still an opportunity for transformation in our community? Whoever wants to take that, go ahead. Okay, I'll go first. Great. Um, absolutely. Um, education 
open doors and open opportunities for all. Uh, and it's so important that uh, as a member of the Alamance Burlington School System um, Board of Education, uh, one of the roles is to ensure that we have access to equal opportunity and equitable opportunity for all students. Um, we realize, and I can just speak for myself personally, uh, that I, my father, um, had a fifth grade education. Uh, my mother at, uh, graduated with, at that time from the 11th grade. Uh, neither one of them had the opportunity uh, to go on to post-secondary education. It was their desire um, that their children receive a higher education, and they knew that education was that door that would open uh, many opportunities uh, for us. Um, I strive also currently to, to do that for my children. Um, and it's unfortunate that in society, due to social economics, that some children do not have that opportunity. Uh, it is available to them, but it is our job to ensure that we educate them, provide access to them, so that they can benefit from education and therefore becoming contributing adults to our society. Thank you. So the question again is about, is education still a tool for transformation in society? Well, I guess I'm an example of, I have to apologize for my accent first of all. Don't apologize. So, I myself, I'm an example of being the product of education. It's like coming from, I come from, from my country, I'm from Venezuela. I did my, all my education to college back home. Being here is proof that education is a factor to transform people in society and give them more opportunities, not only to have a better future, but also to have like a solid understanding of society values, even freedom. Yep. I'd just like to add, um, in creating some notes for tonight's discussion, I wanted to um, share a quote from my friend and colleague, Dr. Buffy Longmire Alvital, who has in her signature line an African proverb that states, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So in regard to education having transformational power, I do believe that, but how is that education presented? Uh, whose education is presented? Uh, I think we, uh, have to look at education from multiple perspectives, um, multiple approaches, uh, using various authors and the presentation of the information that we are to cover. Uh, but until we are truly uh, confront and embrace the multiple ways of knowing and the various sources of information, there will be challenges to education being transformational. And uh, my perspective, <clears throat> as the director of the Alamance Partnership for Children, we work with children birth to five, and our mission is to ready children to enter school. And um, the number one indicator research tells us for a child's success in school is the mother's education level. So when you think about education making a difference and changing our community, you have to think about how when we increase our education level, we provide more opportunities for our children who are then gonna grow up to be adults and parents, it's a generational change. And it takes time, but it's so important. We can't just think about educating one child or a year's worth of children. It's generational and it will change lives forever when we increase education levels in our community. So that's my early ed perspective. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, in my dissertation, I found similar um, findings that would support that as well as far as parents' educational level being a good predictor of children's outcome. But I also believe and, and hold fast to the belief that race is the number one predictor of outcomes in, this, in the United States of America. Um, people, there's a stratification of outcomes based on race where generally across many categories, those outcomes are booked in by whites and blacks 
and sometimes uh, black and Native Americans are toggled between the bottom, uh, whereas whites fare greater, have better outcomes than the other racial groups. Um, and that's across healthcare systems, education, economic, housing, criminal justice. Consistently, the research is overwhelming. It won't take you long to find um, statistics and research that will support that claim. And I, I believe that's a pretty objective statement. So that raises an important transition. We clearly, from your discussion, we see that education is important. But what are some challenges that the United States today faces in terms of education um, and race and ethnicity, the United States and or Alamance County? I mean, based on the experience that I have been, I have had working here for 16 years, I guess one of the biggest challenges is diversity. It's like you have a school system which is so diverse, like the one we have, Elements, ABSS, that you have different groups performing at a different levels, and each one of them is working with what they have, culturally speaking. So we have, I'm gonna speak about a Hispanic community, we have the ESL students, which I, whom I call the double duty students, because they have to learn the content at the same time they are learning the language. So this is like a double task for them. They have to overcome those challenges they have ahead of them. And you have students performing at a different level and uh, expecting for them to achieve standard goals when they are living different realities and they have different resources to work towards those goals. Yeah. Well, and, and again, the racial disparity that we see here in Alamance <coughs> County, I remember it doesn't start when a child walks into school the first day. It started way before that. I was just involved in a discussion group about some, a recent study that looked at expulsion, expulsion excuse me, and suspension from childcare facilities. Yes, children get suspended and kicked out of childcare, which I find amazing, and the the biggest group that gets um, expelled or suspended are young black males, um, by far the biggest group. And so when a child's kicked out of a childcare facility, they're probably not very hopeful about an education setting. So think about that child when they walk into kindergarten their first day, they're not feeling very confident and they're not feeling like they're in a place where they're gonna be successful. So we, again, my message throughout the evening you'll hear is we've gotta start early. It doesn't begin when a child enters kindergarten. These sorts of dynamics are set up long before that. Um, for the elements building in school system, of course, one of our biggest challenges is funding, uh, um, as we know. Um, you know, we have to deal with any and every child that walks through our door. And they come in all kinds of shapes and colors. Um, and there's just so many things that we have to deal with that a lot of people don't understand. Um, social economics, I keep hitting on that because it's so crucial, whether that's for early childhood education, preparing children before they come to school. Um, we have um, African-American males who are suspended at a higher rate uh, than other children. We have, um, and we're no different than any other school system, um, we have a disproportionate number of Caucasians in our AIG programs, academically gifted programs. Um, we have a disparity in course offerings among one school to the other. This is not a systemic uh, method of discriminating, it just has happened over a period of time. Since, since I've been on the board, um, I truly believe that we're heading in the right direction now in terms of recognizing some of those uh, differences. Um, what's exciting is that I, we truly do know that every child comes to school at a different level. And with intervention, with the various programs that we have, uh, we are working with children on an individual basis um, to bring them up to par. We are addressing some of the inequities in our school, in our current um, 
strategic plan that we have um, by placing some specialized programs in some schools. We are increasing our course offering. And the most recent thing um, is the redistricting plan. Uh, we're taking a look at that now and addressing how are we serving our children. Uh, why is one school performing at a certain rate and another schools are performing at a higher rate? Um, there, I truly don't believe there's any type of uh, systemic way of uh, anyone discriminating uh, against individuals. I just think it's a system that um, just needs some improvements in. Dr. Williams, regarding the challenges in education and race today? Yes, um, they're definitely there. They exist. And before the night's over, you will be clear <laughs> about my stance on uh, some of these issues here. And um, I, I do feel that we have to take a uh, look at historical and structural establishments of race and its role in society. Um, beginning with our native people that was that were uh, in this country prior to the arrival of the Europeans, I think you know taking a look at those structures there. I'm mean, even looking at thinking of um, Disney films when you think about Pocahontas and you see the beautiful story of uh, she and John Rolfe and how they were so madly in love and. Uh, that's not the real story. <laughs> I mean, the real story is that Rolf was interested in understanding the processing of tobacco and wanted to infiltrate this group of people to get land and to, not in a system to oppress Native Americans, but in a system to create an advantage for uh, his culture, his, his race, the white race. And so understanding th things as simple as that um, some people are surprised to hear that it wasn't a true love story. Um, and, but something as simple as that, in which we glorify through Disney and through films and, and we feed this into our children's minds and uh, not addressing um, the hard realities of uh, this establishment of, of race and how it has repeatedly turned itself over and over again. Uh, Michelle Alexander states in her book, The New Jim Crow, uh, she talks about how racism reinvents itself throughout the history of time. It's over and over in different fashion, different forms, but it re reinvents itself. Uh, in many in many areas, and so um, this very systemic. If you think about it, just for perspective, and indulge me for a moment, just for, for perspective, uh, when the uh, Africans were first Africans brought over uh, to this land on a Dutch ship in 1619. So from 1619, you go into 1863. Uh, it's talking about Emancip Emancipation Proclamation. <laughs> Um, and then moving from Emancipation Proclamation, when they were supposed to be the abolishment of slavery, to 1954, that rule, the um, Supreme Court case that ruled that separate but unequal is uh, inherently unconstitutional, that's 335 years of separation of races there. And so from 1954 to 2016, 62 years, what have the outcomes been within that time? I mean, this is a massive issue. I don't think that we give the construct of race its due respect. Uh, it is a powerful construct. And uh, until we really respect race as such a monster, um, we're going to struggle as a society to, to live uh, more civilly and have uh, equity in this country. Well, thank you. So that's a good starting point. I would like to hear some questions from the audience. I have enough questions for the entire hour and many more, but I want to hear your thoughts, your questions. Hi, Patsy. I really enjoyed your opening remarks about talking in terms of equity within a school system. What would an equitable school system look like? What would an equitable school system look like? <laughs> Okay, let me talk a little bit about, and I'm speaking from Patsy Simpson. I'm not speaking for the Board of Education or the superintendent. Um, what it would look like to me. Uh, I currently have four children currently in the school system. Uh, my children attend Graham High School. Uh, I've had three graduates, uh, uh, four students, uh, my children graduate from Graham. 
What it would look like is my daughter who's sitting over there who is a junior at East Carolina University, that when she attended Graham High School, there was a limited number of AP offerings from her. She was limited in terms of what her GPA could be, the maximum amount in the sense that she could not take advanced placement courses as opposed to, say, a student at Western or Williams High School. Um, I would like to reverse that. And currently in the um, strategic plan and with the possible redistricting and throwing out ideas, one of the ideas that I threw out in order to have equal opportunities within all schools for course offering that we talk about in dialogue to see if we could concentrate them, say, maybe at one high school and all children wanting to go to college come in and um, take courses there. Um, when I look at, um, I look at my child or my children having the same um, access to um, whatever it might take to enhance their educational opportunities. Um, I look at equity as not necessarily saying that we have to have everything that they have at another school, but we need to have access, the opportunity to be able to um, utilize whatever it might be uh, in terms of improving their education. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, um, I have a question about, you know, if you know any insights on um, the intersection of race and gender. Because um, one thing I found interesting is even though there is institutional and you know, cultural discrimination against women, in many cases they outperform men in academics. Um, this is especially true in the black community according to statistics. So I was just wondering if you had any insights on how race and gender intersect in education. To race and gender intersecting in education. Yeah, I mean, I don't have any statistics to give you. I can actually just show you, you know, I can talk about what I actually see. Uh, you know, and particularly in regards to African-American males, um, I think um, starting in about the third grade, for some reason, a lot of them are just, um, I would, for lack of a better word, turn off in regards to um, education in the sense that, and particularly in our school system, and we have a fantastic school system, but they don't see a lot of African-American males. They don't see a lot of African-American females in front of them. Uh, it is imperative that in our community um, that we bring in um, others at this time to enhance their ac academic op um, opportunities. Um, I think a lot of our young um, African-American males do very well in the area of science. Um, you know, we, we just have to build them up and we have to let them know that they're very smart, very intelligent, and can be anything that they want to be. Although they don't see a lot of um, young men or, or men in front of them on a daily basis in terms of um, aspiring to um, a higher educational level, but intellectually, they can do anything that they want. We understand there are obstacles out there. I'm not going to say, you know, I would be crazy to sit here and say that they're all given equal access and opportunities. You know, I mean, I see when a young African-American male walks in sometimes, say, at a school board, appeals hearing. And I'll hear people say, well, what sports do you play? Uh, they're not here necessarily to get a transfer for sports. They're here to get a transfer because maybe they want some of those AP offerings at another school that they don't have the opportunity to take in our schools. Um, I don't see that on a large basis. However, uh, to say that it's not in our school system would be ridiculous. It is there. Um, and you know we strive very hard to make sure that all children have access and, and have that opportunities. And we have a great community in terms of uh, our sororities and fraternities and a lot of businessmen who do come into our school systems now. They mentor our young men. And they, uh, for those who haven't had a lot of opportunities, um, that they share with them a lot of things to, to try to enhance their educational opportunities. 
I could add just a little bit to that if I think I, uh, if I got your question correct. Um, education is not isolated, is a system that's not isolated from other systems in society. And if you take a look at other systems, you'll see that they're definitely a disproportionate representation along the lines of gender. Um, in, in, in senior administration, and you look at uh, CEO leadership, and there's a definitely a dis disproportionality among, between, the, uh, between genders. And so that is uh, certainly prevalent uh, in education as well. Again, it's not what we see in the broader society and other uh, aspects. Uh, education is not isolated from those aspects as well. Um, but you throw in race, then you're adding another level of oppression to the, um, to the mix. Thank, thank you. Thank you left and then I think right. <clears throat> yes. Um, Despite uh, recommendations from my physician to not do things that raise my blood pressure, I tend to read the Times News. And this Sunday, uh, well, the editorial page, this Sunday, uh, there were two uh, letters to the editor that I thought were very contrasting. One of them basically argued uh, that we need to watch the county commissioners because there's a bait and switch. They come in and saying they're not going to raise taxes, but then they do. And then the other letter, uh, mentioned something to the effect that really touches me a lot, and that's uh, comparing Alamance County, and you guys know this data better than I do, comparing Alamance County and our tax base and what goes to education compared to other comparable counties in North Carolina. And that just, you know, that, that those two letters to the editor just uh, uh, raises a question. How do we, uh, you know, address all of these inequities, I, I think race is huge. I think gender differences are huge. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of issues, but a lot of it goes back to funding for the schools. And so we can raise the level on, in, in address these questions on a structural, uh, structural basis, making our educational system better. So I guess my question embedded in all that is, how do we move the discussion more toward supporting education in Alamance County with tax dollars away from a rhetoric that sees any raising of taxes being uh, something horrible. And so I, maybe that's a, 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 a more toward politics and away from race, but I think uh, that's a big question for me. How do we move the conversation in a direction where people can find a middle and all agree that our children are important, education is important to address all these issues, and how do we get to that point? So, thank question. you. And I'd like to take, take that one. First of all, the county commissioners are a sneaky bunch. Oh, Bob, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. Um. Thanks for consistently attending these, Bob. <laughs> Please come back. Um, no, you know, I think in Alamance County, we have some social norming that we need to do. Um, and I've been a, a part of a lot of groups that talk about education in our community. And one of the themes that sort of keeps coming up is, what's, a, what's the climate in Alamance County around education? We can compare ourselves to other counties that are like us in population and tax base and so forth. But let's look at what's unique about our county. So this is a county that primarily had a lot of textile work for a long, long time. And, and people could graduate high school and they could go and get a job and they can make a really nice living. And um, a friend of mine termed that once as a low skill, high pay job. So they were really great at what they did in the mills, but they had this one skill. And so when the mills started to close down, what happened to those folks? They couldn't go out and earn the same kind of living I don't think our children were encouraged to go on to secondary education because it wasn't as necessary. You look at the counties surrounding us who have a lot of higher education um, systems and the climate is very different, even though you may see the same sort of population. So how do we get the folks in our community to really value education and to make our folks understand? You can't say, hey, it was good enough for me, it should be good enough for the kids today. This is a different world. It's a high tech world. And we are competing on a global level now. Um, I use the statistic in um, some of the talks I give. Do you know now in, in China, there are more children in China who are in their what they would consider their gifted programs than there are children in the United States. So 
we need to wake up, you know, and our county needs to wake up and realize we are in a different world now and we need to elevate education and, and value it. And, and that doesn't need to just happen with our parents that have children in school. That goes for people who don't have children and they need to realize that it affects all of us when we raise the level of our education. And our property taxes, I'm sorry, they're dirt cheap and it's gonna cost some money and I think we need to make that realization. The biggest thing is go out and vote and know who you're voting for is what you need. And, and the last thing, too, I think we need to do a better job on, on educating the public on the lottery funds. Uh, and I think that the um, community needs to speak with their um, members of the House and members of the Senate and find out exactly what's going on with this North Carolina lottery because they sold you a bill of goods in the sense of exactly how that money is appropriated to public education. Um, there are all kinds of caps that are uh, put on it. There's money being diverted to other places other than to education. And then when we do get the education um, monies from the lottery, um, it's supposed to be for capital, and that's the only thing. So we don't have the flexibility to use that money where we might see fit um, to help improve things. Um, but the, the number one thing I think you need to do is we recognize that public education, it costs money, and we need to um, educate ourselves as to who's on that ballot and then go out and vote. Next question. Yeah. So Carrie, you touched on this a little bit about the realization that we are in a globalized world, especially when it comes to education. And Carlos, you also mentioned working with, with students in ESL programs and that idea of um, just languages in general. And so my question is, why do we focus so much on, on English curriculums and not on this idea that there are people with different linguistic backgrounds and we're being, they're being told you have to learn in English when it might be beneficial for them to also learn in their native language as well. I think that's to you. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. You know what it means when somebody says that's a good question, you might not have the answer. <laughs> now, actually, I think it would be great if you could, let's say, it, assess them on their own language, which is ideally so they would have, you would say time, they would say, I mean, all this time to learn uh, the content and English, learning English would be like a second goal. I mean, that would be interesting. But reality is a little bit different. With the Hispanic community we have here in Alamance, most of them, they come from very rural areas, from their native countries. So you're gonna find, let's say, 5% of them or 10%, I'm just guessing, based on experience, with a very good formal education in the first language. So that right there makes it hard to test them or to assess them on the first language. I think it is, I mean, you can do, a, some schools are doing it. They are doing the dual immersion First splash school. program, splash. Which, is, which I think is great because and when I say about diversity being a challenge, a challenge before, I didn't mean in a bad way. I think the more diver diverse a society is, the richer it is because you have a lot of potential here with people from different countries, different backgrounds, different languages. So I think we have to either find a way to give them any kind of assessment where language is not a barrier to show how much they know. Pro probably a nonverbal kind of assessment. But yeah, I mean, if you could do it, like if you could assess them in their own language, it would be nice. The other thing is, although most of them are Hispanic, I mean, they speak Spanish, we have about 28 or 32 different foreign languages in the ESL program. So if you're gonna do something for someone, you would have to do it for everybody. And that there is a huge challenge. One thing that you could do, or the system could do is, 
open a sort of like a newcomer's ESL center where you can help them in a kind of an intensive uh, program to learn the language. Because nowadays what we're doing is we're serving them uh, 30, 30 minutes every day, 45 minutes every day. And it takes time to learn a, a second language, I mean, proficiently when it comes to academics. For example, for a person to develop social English, it takes between three and five years. And to develop academic English, it takes between seven and 10. So a student who gets here when he, is in ninth, he or she is in ninth grade, so seven years to develop academic English, it's gonna be what, 16 years old. By that time, that student is gonna be frustrated. So we have to do something in terms of speeding up the whole process of learning the language and learning the content at the same time. Yes, but testing them in the language, I have thought, I have thought about that for a long time. Yeah, good question. Yes, ma'am. Hi, first I have um, like a little discussion point about what you just said. Uh, so my mom is an ESL teacher. She teaches um, ninth grade students at Smith High School in Guilford County. And um, definitely looking at her experience as a teacher and teaching students from all over, whether they are Hispanic or Vietnamese, um, I definitely um, see the reality of what you have been saying, um, where a lot of these students are really bright and they like to learn, but there is this language barrier um, that um, limits them in how well they are um, able to perform in their other classes while learning, um, while further learning English um, as a ninth grader. So I thank you for what you've said. Um, I also have a question for um, all of you, but um, it pertains to what you said, Randy Williams, in your opening remarks. Um, you commented that um, that learning about race and diversity um, very early on is very important, but there's this um, question of how early and how to do it, because um, there are students who um, are in less diverse communities um, that may not experience um, like interactions with people from other races in their daily lives. And so um, issues of race and diversity um, are very sensitive, um, especially with what we see um, going on in the world today. So my question is, um, how early is it, um, how early is it to um, address issues of race and diversity in the classroom? Um, how appropriate is that? And um, how should we go about doing that? I, <clears throat> I think that uh, the way I, I'm putting on my father's, my, my parent hat now, uh, I think well, as a father of two daughters, um, I think it's very uh, appropriate to start talking with children about differences as early as they recognize this is, uh, the differences as well and talk with them in a way that demystifies the, um, the, the concept of talking about differences along a wide range of identities. That way, that will open up the conversation and allowing people to ask more questions, uh, to give responses, to provide different ways of looking at this, a situation and understanding uh, I, different identities. So I think that it can happen uh, as to when, when someone brings up or a child brings up a, a recognition of some differences, engage that child in a conversation and be and just have the ability to, well, hopefully have the ability to lead them in a direction that will let them know that it's okay to talk about differences and how differences enrich our society and make us stronger. Um, so I, I think that it will vary depending on the situation. Uh, oftentimes the, ed the answer in education is it depends. And so uh, thinking about when that particular child or in that particular parent or teacher uh, are, is comfortable with engaging with that student on a level of speaking with differences, I think it could start at a, a various rate or um, age ranges. If I could, I I'm sitting here thinking, talking about children in public school about race. And then I think back on, um, I've been in this county for 23 years, and I don't think we've ever had a discussion on race until the time news and Elon University started this particular form. 
Um, so my point is, a lot of people just don't like to talk about race in general. Um, and I don't know of um, anything in the public school system where there's any type of curriculum or anything in which children are given an opportunity. Um, you know, and then we as parents have certain feelings about individuals speaking with our children about race outside of the household as well. So you have to contend with that as well. Um, but one thing I've learned, and it really hit home with me, I currently have two daughters who are Caucasians, and never have they ever, ever said anything to me about, Mom, you look different than we do. That has taught me a lot about race. I'm very fortunate. I have African-American biological children. I have white children. I have biracial children in my home. And that's really never a subject that we talk about until something bad happens or they are confronted with it. Um, and then it usually comes up. But we just got to get to a point, and I'm so appreciative of Elon University and the Time News in hosting these series on race, because to my knowledge, it's the first time where um, I've been to any event where we can openly and publicly talk about race. And can I weigh in on how young? <laughs> um, children aren't born racist. It's exactly. learned. Um, so when you talk about how young you need to have these conversations with children, that you should always have these conversations with children. Children notice differences, but they don't do it out of um, anger or fear. They just see a difference, and it's curiosity. Um, a good friend of mine who runs our Developmental Day Center here in Alamance County, it's an inclusive childcare facility, so they have half special needs children and half typically developing, what's typically developing, that phrase always cracks me up, um, children in her center. And um, she was telling a story the other day um, in the two-year-old class where the fire department was there and they were teaching the kids how to stop, drop, and roll. So the kids were all rolling around on the ground. And one of the children has a corner chair that she sits in and it limits her mobility because she doesn't have a lot of strength in her midsection. So the kids looked over and they said, well, we gotta unstrap her and we gotta roll her around on the floor. And they rolled her around and she just needed to be doing what they were doing. And I'm telling you, those children didn't see a difference. They just saw that she needed to be part of the group. Thank you. Can I say yes, something? Please. I have to say this. <laughs> it's like when I'm working with, I work in elementary school, Andrews Elementary. What makes my days is looking at the kids, just what you said. So you're Hispanic, white kid, African American kid, Asian kid holding hands. So like they don't see any difference. So like, I'm being from another culture, to me it is shocking, even at this point. In my country, we don't have the race issue. It is not there. It's like the first time I came here to the United States, I had to fill out a form, say, what's your race? I wrote human. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wrote. It's like, and uh, even there are differences that we have to recognize, we have to respect, and we have to treasure them because every race has I mean, its own value, culture, it is beautiful. Because otherwise, you would be like living in a black and white uh, world. I mean, that's what makes life beautiful, diversity. So I don't, even there are those differences, I don't think those differences should be translated into the social system, education. I mean, they don't make it, they shouldn't make any difference when it comes to education and to every other uh, activity a person has to perform in society. So when I came here, even nowadays at the beginning of the school year, they asked me to fill in the form, what's your race? I keep on writing human. Because for example, in my case, it's like I'm a third Spanish descendant. I'm a third Native American from Native Americans in my country. I have a third of their blood. I'm a half Portuguese because my father was Portuguese. So what race is that? Human, isn't it? <laughs> so I don't see, I mean, I love the fact <laughs> how the kids 
they sort of like, they see the difference, but they don't use it to discriminate in any way. And I think that's the way we wish sh- adults. Well, I mean, we're supposed to be smarter than they are. <laughs> so that's the way we should act and live our lives when it comes to races and rights. Take a question on this side, and then I'll follow up. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you can talk more about the issue of, say, of uh, gang violence and criminal activity that's especially surrounding inner city schools around the United States, because I think one of the bigger areas that a lot of student, that a lot of young uh, students, they're easily influenced by outside factors, especially by violence and all, and makes it harder for them to continue on into school, and they can end up in bad company. So. Uh, what are some of the new programs and developments that, whether it's in Alamance County or the United States, to try and deter these students from falling into the into g- company of gang members and trying to get them to continue on into school and to into a better future? Well, understand that's not just an inner city school problem. We have that in many rural counties in North Carolina. So, just to kind of set that stage, it's not just in our bigger towns and cities. And one of the things that I say about um, gangs um, to parents, if there's gangs in the community, then there's gangs in your school. Do we have a lot of gangs in our schools, um, in our school system? I don't believe that we do. I do believe it's there, and it would be crazy for us not to believe that it's there. Um, in terms of programs, we currently um, we have the DARE program that works with our middle school um, students um, on gang related activity, drugs, um, things of that nature. We have the Junior Police Academy with um, the Burlington um, Police Department. Um, we have, um, um, I can't think of her name, but uh, we do have a program in the school system, but that's usually when um, we identify that um, students have participated in you know, drug-related type activities um, where she um, works with our our students. Um, I see two of my fellow board members here. I can't think of any other gang-related programs. Of course, we have, oh, the court system, what is it? When students, unfortunate, have to go to a teen court program. Uh, We also welcome speakers in on a regular basis into our school systems. Um, to talk about gang activities. And um, uh, one of our board members is a member of the, uh, I guess it's like a liaison with the um, gang task force. Um, There is an Alamance County gang task force. We meet with them or uh, a member meet with them on a regular basis. Uh, And we work very well with our police department and with the sheriff department in identifying new gangs. But believe me, the names change weekly. As soon as you learn the name of a gang and you go out looking for that gang, they change the name to to something else. Um, We are quite aware that it is in our community, therefore it's in our school, and we worked um, very hard to uh, eliminate any um, activity um, during the school hours. Yes, ma'am. Okay. First off, I wanted to say thank you all for coming to this panel. I'm so very thankful that you're here to discuss this topic with us. Um, So from what I've been hearing, education, as we all see, is very valuable and it's very important. And one of the main issues that we've been discussing tonight is access to education, access and opportunity. Um, Sometimes can be used interchangeable. Um, So as far as access, we know programs like mentoring programs are valuable and that they work. We know that building relationships with kids, um, having kids have role models, those types of things are important for their learning and for their growth. Uh, We also know that early education is very important and that these kids, they start learning at a very young age inside the home. And that starts before kindergarten. And what happens is these kids come into kindergarten behind the ones that don't have the access to preschool, to pre-K programs. Um, So with all that being said, one of the big issues we were talking about was budget. Um, So one of my questions is, what can we do as a community um, to help with these budget problems? What should we be doing? Because it takes a village, as we all have heard before, and I don't feel like our community is really pulling together enough to face these issues. 
Wow, can you write me a check? <laughs> can you get everybody in the room to write a check? Um, money is always a big issue. And it's, you know, in early childhood, um, we, we really are coming of age where um, so many people are starting to realize how important this time is. 90% of brain development happens in the first five years. So and that's, the, that's the time we spend the least amount of money on our children. Um, for every dollar spent um, in early childhood, you save $10 in social services and jail time and um, other cost, costly social services. So. Um, let me give you some facts about our community. There's about 12,000 children, birth to five in Alamance County. Of those children, data tells us about 8,000 of those children need some sort of childcare because they have, they're from a single parent home, that parent works, or both parents work. Um, of those 8,000 children, only 3,000 children are in licensed regulated care. So what about those other 5,000? We don't know where they are. We don't know what kind of care they're getting. It could be great care that's not licensed or regulated. Doesn't mean it's bad care. Um, it could be unlicensed care that's dangerous um, or even just not enriching. So for all those children, um, a lot of them would like, their parents would like for them to be in a high quality center. We don't have the slots. We certainly don't have the funding. Right now we have about 500 children on the waiting list for childcare subsidy. Subsidy vouchers are given to parents, <clears throat> excuse me, who either work or they're in school so that their children can be in a high quality childcare center. Um, there's a huge waiting list. That, that doesn't even scratch the surface of the need. Most people know there's a waiting list and they don't even bother to apply. Um, our NC pre-K program, Title I programs in the school for pre-K, and Head Start also have waiting lists in the 500 range. So many of those parents know too, slots are full, there's no point in applying. So talk to your representatives. Smart Start took a cut a few years ago of about 20%. We've never recovered from that. Um, part of our budget goes for subsidy vouchers and supports high quality education for children. Um, I, I hate to go back to the money issue, but we do what we can with very, very limited funds. And we certainly don't touch all 12,000 children that need our support, not even close. So Steve Rydell, <laughs> um, um, excuse me, Dennis Rydell, Steve Ross, and um, Rick Gunn, our, our representatives. Now, none of those um, representatives work on a particular committee that deals with early childhood, but they vote. And they also talk to their colleagues. So we need to let them know how important this is in our community. Um, as far as the public school system, um, last year, our county commissioners um, did a fantastic job in terms of increasing uh, funding to the public school system. We were able to retain our teacher's assistant, which we value uh, in the classroom. Um, we are working closer with them than we have in my eight years uh, on the board. So now it's an election time. So as I said earlier, know who you're voting for. Uh, we're very fortunate also in this community. Um, I think with the merger of um, Alamance Regional Hospital with um, Cone Hospital in Greensboro uh, created uh, Impact Alamance. And um, they have just done a tremendous job in assisting the public school system, whether that be um, for training of our teachers or leadership academies or even improving playgrounds, uh, public parks in the area. Um, but that partnership um, with Impact Alamance um, has um, helped us tremendously. What you can do, I mean, Elon University has been fantastic to the public school system. Um, the Village Project, you can tutor with the Village Project um, to, to help our children out in terms of tutoring. Um, Elon University is maintaining the Teachers Fellows Program, which our current legislators got rid of. And uh, we're gonna have a tremendous uh, shortage of, of teachers in the near future. Um, so, um, let's see, uh, ACE, Alamance Citizens from Education. Uh, we have a classroom closet that provides supplies uh, for our teachers in the classroom so that those funds don't come out of their pocket. 
Um, I would suggest that you volunteer uh, for those types of things. Um, you know, Alamance County in the last two to three years, we are making some major strides and we just need to keep going forward and recognizing, as we said earlier, education is the foundation for our community. So it will help in terms of economics. It helps in terms of being a better community. So I would just encourage you to continue to volunteer and most of all, know who you're voting for. We're running short on time, so I'm gonna to get to these next two questions. How you all doing? I have a question on uh, universal education in the United States. Um, so the idea that um, you know, a poor white student in Kentucky doesn't need the same things as a rich black kid in Maryland, uh, and recognizing you know, the, the difference in a, a place where we have 50 states and the states are so vastly different, people are so vastly different, situations are so vastly different, um, and then that goes even, even greater scale for all the countries of the world. Um, so how do we foster a healthy global environment of competition um, and how do we uh, determine like uh, values to you know, weigh each other against in a sense uh, when we have a need for a diversity in education, a need for different people to learn different things. Uh, and you know, I'm thinking like in specific reference to say like the Common Core uh, and different global educational standards which say China is the greatest thing on the face of the earth, but I'm like they just value different things uh, and we are better than them in other things that we don't know how to measure yet. Um, so how do we foster a global sense of healthy competition? That just question. wore me out hearing your question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 start, I'll start a little bit to get us going here. Um, I think there is a fine line between um, healthy competition and getting ahead uh, with all, some of the adverse effects that could come, out, come from that. So whenever there is some advantage, inherently there is some oppression. Mm -hmm. So as you... As, as one side, one person, one group excels and gets ahead and has an advantage to a, a point of being considered an advantage, then there's another group in oppression <coughs> level right there. And so trying to reconcile and have a balance of being uh, um, industrious and achieving goals and being successful, uh, how that's done, though, has to be um, carefully um, in, in careful consideration of the environment and those around so you don't put yourself at uh, somewhat of an advantage over others. I mean, we think about the concept of affirmative action, which was introduced in, by President Kennedy in the 60s and, and brought to life by President Johnson. <clears throat> But affirmative action has actually been around since the 1600s. Um, so uh, just thinking about the system of oppression and um, advantage and oppression. I just want to say this. We have a very di diverse society. We need a diverse school college system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We need to make it diverse too. I guess at this point, college is the best option, of course, for everybody if everybody could go to college. So we have to look, my point of view, we have to look into other ways to educate, give people, put people into a path, into a career. That could be technical, like ACC, technical careers. That could be programs within high schools. I mean, something where the students, they don't need to have just wait till, till they finish high school and go into college and four years later start working. So I guess we can prepare them from the very beginning, I mean, way before uh, even finishing high school. And probably if you do that, you would create a culture, the uh, college awareness we need. And that's one of my things that I worried a lot when it comes to the uh, Hispanic community because what we understand as college education, that's not precisely the way they understand it. And it's not only for the Hispanic community, there are certain groups where college awareness is not there, it just goes, mm -hmm. for them, I mean, if they 
can make it to high school, get a job, and live, I mean, whatever life they think they're living, that's, to them, that's overachieving already. So we need to have a diverse system where college, I mean, still can be the best option, but we need other options for everybody, for those who cannot go to college right after high school. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a final question for the evening from the audience? Um, good evening. Thank you for being here tonight. I just want to talk a little bit about universal, universality, as he mentioned, in education. Um, in my 31 years of work, it's all been in human service, whether in employment or in primary health care, and for 19 years in affordable housing. And one thing I see that all of us could do, perhaps, to give our children a better chance of success, to give our teachers a better chance at success in the classroom, to use our dollars more wisely, is to, to make efforts or make movements within our own lives to, to stabilize our family home environment. Um, so many of our children are born into single parent homes. Please know I understand that. My brother was a single father with custody of three kids. My brother-in-law was a single dad with custody of one. Um, I'm not discrediting that role. It's a very, very difficult role. Uh, based upon my experience, a child oftentimes, not always, but often, has a better chance of success if there are at least two committed adults or more, a larger family tree, committed not only to each other and being knit together, but committed, committed to helping that child succeed. It's just a personal observation, but one that I see over and over and over. I see it in my own family. My oldest brother was the first person from our family ever go to college because my parents made their decision when they got married, having just come out of high school, we're going to do better by our kids. Um, it's just a thought, though. I think that that would work across every demographic, every ethnicity that's present in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. And can I give a comment on that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I was speaking to um, one of our local representatives, and we were talking about parents in our community, and he used the phrase, bad parents, and um, that just kind of hurt my heart, because I've worked in um, the field of early childhood and worked with other children and families my whole life, and I've come across some parents that are not so great, but I've never come across what I would say is a really, truly bad parent. I think parents sometimes don't have the tools to do what they need to do, but it's rare that you meet a parent who doesn't want better for their children. Um, I think what we have to do and, and what the partnership's always been charged with is helping to strengthen the family unit, whatever it looks like. And now our families come in so many different shapes, sizes, and colors. Um, and I think we're finding our ways to make things work. And it doesn't have to be a traditional family. Um, I think we need to work on giving families the tools they need to be great parents and to live to that expectation they have to do better by their children. Anybody else mm -hmm. want to follow up? Well, we are approaching the end of our time, but I have four really smart people here who have a lot of perspectives. So I just want to end with a closing question. What is something, in your opinion, that we should take away from this conversation about race and um, education and ethnicity? What's something we should know? What you want to tell us about? I'll, I'll start, um, and I just want to um, borrow um, a metaphor from my uh, colleagues at the Racial Equity Institute in Greensboro. Um, they start a presentation off by stating that if you go out to a lake and you notice that a fish is belly up, you will examine the fish to see what's wrong with the fish. If you go out the next day and you see a lake that's half full, belly up with fish, you're not only just going to look at the fish, but you wonder what's wrong with the lake. Is there something wrong with the lake? So as we think about turning this into this conversation here and looking at the number of programs, whether they're mentoring, early start, all these types of things that are going to address the fish, i.e. the oppressed people, 
what are we doing to address the system as well? So as we do things and provide support systems for the, for the people, we should also take a look at the systems. Um, a part of this tonight's conversation seems to have gotten away, my, from my perspective, gotten away from the concept of race. It is a difficult topic to discuss. But we have to engage in this conversation and we have to stay in this conversation and not lose sight of it. Statistically, when you look across infant mortality rates, traffic stops, housing, employment, educational attainment, across all these categories and more consistently, there's a stratification of outcomes based on race. We should be asking why. Why is that the case? Why is that so prevalent in this society? when you look at so many categories and you see the same consistent outcomes. Until we get an understanding that we ask that question enough times and we, including Randy Williams, and get a deep understanding of that, we will be stymied in our growth and in our development. So I urge you to ask why and seek that answer. Thank you. Final I forgot what the share. question was. <laughs> um, it was one other thing that I wanted to talk about, and I think we talked a little bit briefly on the phone. And um, it, it is the current redistricting of our school systems here in Alamance County. Um, and I want to share a little bit about that, um, if I could. Um, as you know, we have severe overcrowding, and particularly in Southern High School and Eastern High School. Um, and as a result of a lot of discussion and how to handle that, um, we decided that we needed to make sure that we utilize um, the classroom space that we currently have in the school system before we addressed um, building additional facilities. So this is one of the major undertakings that um, we've done in this county, I guess, ever. Uh, as a little historical, um, information when we merged the county school systems with the city school system, we did nothing to uh, really address the attendance lines um, in the school system. Um, due to not, uh, not race, uh, let me make something very clear. You cannot use race. It is against the law of this land in redistricting students. However, um, personally, I feel that we have to address access, we have to address equality, and we have to um, make sure that all students are given an equal opportunity and the same access to public education. So originally, our superintendent set out to address the overcrowding at those two high schools. Um, the Board of Education, we came up with certain things that we wanted to make sure, proximity to the home. Um, we, did, we wanted to make sure um, that um, there was a whole list of things. And throughout this time, I have said, we have got to address what I call our inner city schools, which is the Graham Cummins and Williams Zone. To do that would be a travesty. It would be unjust. We have a vision plan that this community came up with three years ago. And it was the vision that Alamance Burlington School System would be a world-class system that other people would look at and envy. In order to do that, there is no way that we could build a new high school without addressing um, the Williams, Cummins, and Graham. Um, after meeting with members of the facility task force, community leaders, and others, um, we, the members of the Board of Education, recognize that we have to address those schools, and we need to start looking at Alamance County as a county school system and not the old Burlington and city school and um, the city and county schools. So I hope each of you know that as a result of that conversation, the superintendent has now divided the county into four quadrants. Um, and in doing so, that is now the beginning basis 
of a discussion, hopefully, that we can have in this community. So I say that to invite you to say that we, in order to have that world-class system, in order to not have schools that I know many of you do not want, where there might be 12 white students, uh, 12 black students in a school, and then the others are all Caucasians. We don't want that. We truly believe this community in diversity. We, um, there's so many things that are happening. I ask you to join us, the members of the Board of Education, to help us design our schools to be what you want them to be and how we can serve all children and give all children access and that equal opportunity. So in the upcoming months, we will be having many discussions outside of the regular school board meeting. Please use this as an opportunity to design, be creative, and to create a school that any and all of us would want our children to attend. This is something major for us, and we need your help in doing it, and we need to make sure that our schools look like and have access to wonderful programs so that our children, all children, can be contributing adults to Alamance County and that we would all be proud of. So I solicit your help in that process. Thank you. Final thoughts, what should we take away from this? Well, I would like to expand a little bit on what Randy said. Um, when he talked about the why, I think we also need to go even a little further and, and ask ourselves, why do we need to care? Um, how does this pertain to all of us? So when we look at racial disparity, it's, it's not a black problem, it's not a Hispanic problem, it's, it's everyone's problem. And when we talk about all children, and that's certainly in our mission, we mean all children. And we need to look at issues with not equality so much as equity, and how we're serving our families. But I think, again, I think we need to even go deeper. This, these problems don't just happen. You know, we need to get at the root of why these, um, these issues are happening and why there's so many differences in the way our children are educated and the way our children are viewed even on that first day of school. Why, do, why does a, a, a young black child walk into a childcare facility and immediately is, is sought after as a behavior problem? What's going on there? That's not the child. That's not where that's coming from. So again, I think we need to dig a little bit deeper and look at the root of this problem. Thank you. I guess I'm gonna go back to the gap in diversity. So we have this diversity in our school system, which is great, community. Uh, definitely we have to work or try to create sort of like a diverse system to serve them. Uh, we have to call, close the gap between different groups. And when I say close the gap, when I see a kid who is not achieving a goal, I'm not looking at his race, I'm looking at a kid who can achieve any goal we want him to achieve if we give him or her the right education opportunities for him or her to get it. We talked about different points from gangs to different issues. I think I would like to point out that early education would be sort of like a way to solve a lot of these issues. Because the earlier you start education, the more and the faster they learn. I want to give you an example. Students who go to pre-K are those students who fail somehow, perform at the lowest when they are taking the pre-K assessment. When they go to kindergarten, those kids, the ones who went to pre-K, they are the most advanced in kindergarten. That should ring some bells somewhere. Um, equal opportunities, I think everybody should have equal opportunities. It doesn't matter what school you attend, you should have the same programs available to everybody. And one thing that we have to create is college and higher, higher education awareness. If we don't teach our kids that education goes beyond high school, they don't pursue it. I mean, that's what I would take home. That's what I would try to 
work on if I had the opportunity to do it. For the money, the questions about the money, where are we gonna get the money? Money is out there. Just talk to the right person, to the right people, and I guess with a good program, that would come. Great. Well, thank you. Let's have a round of applause for our panelists.